This is the Producers Podcast. Featuring the most respected international talent in the world of audio production and voiceover. TV, radio, film, and more. In-depth interviews and industry insights. Putting you on the inside. Learn more at ryandreen.com. The Producers Podcast. With Ryan Dreen. And yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast. Um, always appreciate your time. Would appreciate a rating or review if you can do that. Wherever you get your podcast, it's all good. Uh, this is episode 137 featuring voice actor Neil Wilson, who has a pretty significant background in radio and also radio imaging. So just kind of an FYI, uh, we start there. And right around the 30-minute mark is where we transition to full-on voiceover talk as he is operating a very successful voiceover business. And I try to get really into the nuts and bolts and talk about all the facets of you know, running your own business um, as a voice actor. So again, that's at about the 30-minute mark. Also should note, there is more football talk in this episode than any show I've ever done, and you'll see why. And finally, I wanted to make mention of the Neil Wilson post on my website. Depending on where you're getting this audio, you might not ever go to my website. If you are an aspiring voice actor or, you know, a 30-year vet, the thing that I liked the most was the intricate detail he put into the post on his website about his studio build. It starts with literally, here's the sort of old rickety cottage that I'm going to gut, and it goes picture by picture every single moment of the process. It's an excellent post, one of the most comprehensive ones I've seen on building a voiceover studio. So I hope you check that out. It is linked again. Just uh, go to episode 137 on ryandreen.com or search Neil Wilson. Should come up right there at the top. Uh, Neil Wilson is a voice actor. He is heard on many radio stations. He does national TV promo work, uh, TV affiliate work, commercial, narration, etc., etc. And by the way, he's a fan of this one football team that you can't ever forget if you've ever hung out with him for even 15 seconds. No, he's actually not the most annoying football fan that exists, but you will definitely know uh, what he likes by meeting him. Anyway, he's a good dude. Uh, He's one of the people I bring on the show that's actually a friend. Sometimes I'm hesitant. The last thing I want is for people to think, oh, that dude just brings his friends on. Uh, But Neil and I have gotten to know each other over the years, Um, so certainly has earned whatever spotlight it is that this show puts on people. So let's get us a nice, well-rounded demo from Neil and bring him on, the one and the only Neil Wilson. The voice is instantly recognizable. Hi there, this is Reba. Well, we're we're talking about her music, but you know, that too. Star 94.1. Welcome back. You ready to start this show? Back back, back to the music faster. Keep your radio right right here. 1017 The Beat. Just Bill. Let me finish. I promise what I have is better. In an all-new live stand-up special. We got this covered. Bill Maher, live from Oklahoma. Saturday, July 7th. Your alternative rock is here. Is here. He's here. He's here. Hello, we are Bastille. Hey, it's Bishop Brick Brick Brick. 1067 The End. Delicious. Mike and Molly, weekdays on FX. Doctor, doctor. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to learn how to play this. It's in tune and everything. A's, Giants, Sunday at 8, 7 central on ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. These are extreme houseboats. So all aboard. There's thousands of people, but you are the one in the front row witnessing Coldplay live. Trust. First alert weather on Live 5 News. GoCountry105.com. It's all online. Stream them online. Listen all day. Absolutely. That's what we do. All right, and there he is. Uh, th- this time, it's it's not too often that I do a podcast where I say I'm bringing on my friend, uh, but today I bring on a- an actual real-life friend, Neil Wilson, the voice of radio, TV, promo, commercials, and more, and also a fan of this one football team we'll talk about in a bit, too. <laughs> Neil, uh, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate it. I can't believe you called me a fr- like I got goosebumps. It, it's <laughs> I'm, it's very, very much the holiday spirit, I guess, right? I know. Yeah, I am feeling... Well, you are my final interview of the year, and it is the holidays, and so yeah. But no, no. I mean, we, we're we're legit friends. I think we can say that, right? Yeah, you know, you know, when we've <laughs> shared drinks and steaks yeah. and four pound lobsters. Oh god. Oh. <laughs> I, you know what? Actually, I would say that lobster was more than four pounds. I mean, it might have been four, but looking at it, it was thirty. 
So we were at the Palm for uh, for CRS last year, and uh, we went out to dinner at the end, kind of with all the people that were left over. And it, it who all was at the table? It was uh, Heather Walters, and uh, it was Maurice you and Tobias. me, and Maurice. And anyway, mm-hmm. so I, lobster is one of my favorite foods, and I was like, well, I don't know if I want a steak, but so they had two options. They had a three pound lobster and a four pound lobster, and I was like. Four doesn't seem like that much when you think about how much of the lobster you're losing, right? You're only mm-hmm. eating the tail and maybe the claws. That thing was humongous. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it was, it well, was everybody's meal got served on a normal dinner plate, and then yours came out on, on a legit platter. Um, but it was funny, I think, because you were like, well, what should I get, the three or the four? I'm like, because I think the three, let's say the three was $100 and the four was $112. And I'm like, well, mathematically, it makes sense to get the four. Right. So how do you not get the four? Yeah, I think it was like the manager came over and like cracked the the claws and like it was a whole presentation. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a situation. Um, but anyway, uh, so if you hit up the, the website, uh, ryandreen.com and hit the Neil Wilson page, there are a couple different links there. Um, we did hear Neil's fabulous demo, although that was more of a, Hey, Neil, you want to be on the podcast? Or we had been talking about this for quite a while and you're like, Oh, so I should probably put together some audio. So that's really just a, a nice quick sample of of what you do no and you when you, when i was like i should put together some audio and then i said you're like oh i only need like a minute and a half and yeah i was like how am i gonna how am i gonna yeah. snapshot everything i do in a minute and a half um you, you know the the good the big gigs you've had i remember the bill maher by the way because uh I'm, i happen to be a pretty big fan of his um so i remember hearing that one air before i knew you had booked that um and i think you put that in the demo you sent me yeah, that was a that was a fun one. That was actually during yeah. um, Promax, which is in was in New York at the time, and <clears throat> most of us never leave our home studios. Um, so I, I got to like go into a fancy studio and record with HBO. It was really neat. Mm, that's cool. Um, now let me just throw. I want to get this out of the way because I don't want this episode to be all about this. But uh, in your obituary. Do you think it'll lead with something about voiceover or your career, or will it lead with something about your football fandom? Probably, it's probably going to be football related. I bet <laughs> it'll be like Neil Wilson, lifelong Forty ers fan, and also yeah, and then and then third, by the way, it'll be and his survived by his wife and his children. But yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but but so so you're a Forty ers fan, uh, and I actually I can't remember this because I have a terrible an understatement. memory. Yeah, like, no, really? that's an, I'm sorry. What I meant was you're a psychotic Forty ers lover, uh, whatever fanatic. But you did you do you have any regional? connection to San Francisco? No. And you know what's funny is when I when I I will get copy and people will think that I'm in San Francisco. Yeah. Because right. they just know me as this giant Niners fan. Um and I had I kind of just let the joke play itself and like, oh yeah, I'm definitely in San Francisco. <laughs> sure. I'm on the West Coast. Um but I'm not. You know, I grew up in the Midwest. Um and uh there's actually a video that the Niners came and did years ago. They um it was when my son, who's now six, he was like 18 months old. And um, so the Niners put a call out for um, unique fans in different areas of the country and blah, 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 blah. So I had replied to him and said, hey, I'm I'm pretty unique. Like I named my kid after Bill Walsh. Um, I At the time, I was wearing a uniform for the game. That was about 15 pounds ago. Um, <laughs> and so they came to the house and filmed this whole movie about kind of my history as a Niners fan. And then, um, my fandom, my game day routines, all this mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Um, and you know, I was able to tell the story how I grew up in the Midwest and I wasn't going to, i never kind of have done what society says, Hey, you should, you should do this or you, sh- here's what society is. I've always kind of bucked the trend and, mm-hmm. um, at the time, the Niners were really, really good, uh, 80s and 90s. Yeah, so it was easy I, It was easy to kind of bandwagon on, but then it's, yeah, it's just kind yeah, of— That's what I was going to say. It's kind no, of it's just an easy exploded. team. Yeah, it's just yeah. <laughs> over the top. <laughs> they had the one of the biggest uh, crushing wins in Super Bowl history, right? 55 I watched that. to 10 against uh, yeah. the Denver Broncos. The Broncos. Yeah, it was yeah. Pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw that. I, I think I'm—I don't remember what year that was, but I moved to Denver not too long after that, and I was pretty happy because I was a Raider fan, and the Raiders were still pretty good. 
And uh, then, of course, they went into the toilet for an extremely long time. Yeah, they're still kind of there. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. They they live in the toilet. They have uh, permanent residency in the toilet. Even the Super Bowl year in 03, or uh, I think it was 03, that was still a toilet bowl year. I mean, you know, because they weren't even really in the game. Yeah, let's not talk about football anymore. <laughs> uh, I mean, we can so, make this whole podcast about uh, football this time if you'd like. Yeah, <laughs> man. Nah, let's not. Let's not. And in fact, uh, I've already talked about the 49ers more than I ever would want to either. No offense. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I have no, I have no hate for the 49ers. I just, I'm indifferent. But I, I, you know, I, uh, I, as big of a Niners fan as I am, I like to objectively look at the game of football and I, I like to learn the game of football and kind of the nuances and the chess pieces. So sure. I'm not like, uh, one of those fans that's so rabid. Yes, I am rabid, but, um, I like the, I like the nuance. I like to understand the game. It's not just animalistic lust for your team blindly and, and you know, but but also, uh, what was I going to ask you? Um, oh, yeah, how many games did you go to just this season? We are in week uh, 15, right? Is this week 15 of the NFL season as we're talking? Yeah, so, um, yeah, there's two more games left. So yeah. I went to week one in Tampa. I went to the Monday night game against uh, the Browns. Um, I went to week 12 uh, when they lost against the Seahawks, um, and then I was uh, in the new, at the New Orleans game. Uh, here so you only went to four? It felt like every single day I was seeing you, you're like, yep, on my way to, the, to San Francisco. Or, <laughs> like, I, I would have assumed you went to 10 games this year. I mean, maybe perception is reality, but <laughs> or I'm really good okay. at you know, putting out there that I'm only there yeah. every now and then. But, um, and th- but I have plans to go to, um, here's hoping, fingers crossed, that we can get the number one seed in the playoffs. So I want to go to the first game, the first playoff game at Levi Stadium. Um, and then if if you know if the football gods are smiling upon us, I'll be at the Super Bowl in Miami. Oh, so you will go to the Super Bowl? Of, well, that's a dumb question. Of course, you would. <laughs> you would probably trade. All I want to do is watch my team win a Super Bowl in person. I was at the Super Bowl in New Orleans when it was here, and they lost to the Ravens a few years ago. And you want to talk about the walk of shame? I mean, mm-hmm. like, yeah. First of all, I didn't. I didn't. It was so full of Ravens fans that it was hard to like high five anybody near me when good stuff happened but i mean they shot themselves in the foot that whole game it was just a miserable game and i'm a miserable person when the niners lose yeah and, but just to walk out of the super bowl like oh yeah especially knowing the uh the, the tab you just spent to be there <laughs> yeah it, i mean it really wasn't terrible because i didn't have to worry about flight and hotel like yeah i mean i had to worry true. about parking Right? No, that that's very true. Yeah. Um, Getting to go to a local Super Bowl. I have a buddy who comes in with me for the games, and he actually flew into, for that game, he flew into Shreveport because that was the closest flight he could get, which is way like, if you don't know the geography of Louisiana, like it's like a boot, and Shreveport's up by like the knee of the That's the, the boot. Texas. That's Texas. Yeah, yeah, it's like way way up by Arkansas. So he, And he, dro- he flew into Shreveport and drove down because he couldn't get, couldn't get a flight into New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think we I think we covered football for this podcast let's, <laughs> again. <let's, yeah. laughs> I go all day. Uh, uh, you have a, a military background. Yeah. So um, the military was uh, uh, I used it as a uh, for the GI Bill to go to college, and I never yeah. went to college. Oh, um, well, I thought, oh, hey, it'll be cool. I'll join the military and I'll do communications in the military. And I mean, that was about as long as my military <laughs> career lasted. Um, I did. Um, it was a signal support. It was a 31 uniform. And I don't even think that that, that MOS exists anymore in the military. Um, basically, our what, unit... What what branch? It was uh, Army National Guard. Okay. That's, okay. Got it. So our unit um, was, a, was, a, um, was like a field artillery unit. So um, they had um, the guys who would run the howitzers, which are those... I mean, the best way to explain them is big, giant guns. With yeah. artillery shells that are the size of your torso, um, are they the ones that are like kind of attached to a to a trailer? They're on yes. wheels. You yeah, can move yeah, them around yeah. that way. Yeah. So I would run communications between those howitzer launching points, and um, part of my communications unit. I was like the guy who would go out and fix the communications. So mm. they were wired communications between these howitzer. Um, these howitzer stations, and if there was an issue in those communication lines, I was a dummy who ran out there and, and fixed them. Hmm. 
did you did you ever see any any you know live combat or, or any you know were you, I, you know, I don't know the right words but were you ever in? no no my uh, okay. my unit was actually they went to Iraq um right right I got out right before 20 uh 2001 right before 9/11 okay. that's what um, I couldn't remember the time frame and uh, okay. my unit went to Iraq like like not long after it might have been the june afterwards yeah and they wow. did a, did two years over there and and everybody came back oh that's i was going to god everybody you know there were no casualties as a matter of fact my one of my buddies who was in the unit he came back and it wasn't long after that that we got married uh my wife and i and he came and he was like the best video game player in the history of video i was like what in the hell did you do in iraq and he was wow. saying he was telling me that they were running convoys for um, they would run convoys for like twenty four hours and then they had like forty eight hours off or hmm. sometimes seventy two hours off and they there was nothing to do so they would play video games and I'm like you're pissing me off because you're so good at these video games yeah but you know thank you for protecting our freedom yeah. and doing what thank you, you did for over your there. service yeah <laughs> <laughs> now can I please win this game of Madden <laughs> yeah just one yeah yeah you can be a hundred and one okay uh, that's cool man well anyway um, that's great I wanted to make sure we we talked about uh, that part of your background and then the next question I have is you know very open but what was the first time or the first job talking for money talking for money um. Gosh, if we want to dive into the beginning, I think I always wanted to work with my voice. Um, and, and really, I wanted to act. Um, I don't, wouldn't say that I got paid, but my first real acting experience was in, like, junior high school mm -hmm. um, when I was, the, uh, I was in a play called Death by Chocolate. And okay. I played the gay aerobics, uh, aerobics instructor, and his the character's name is Dick Simmering. <laughs> true, true story. <laughs> now, wait, where were you at the time? Uh, you I know, grew up in uh, an region. area of the, so right on the Iowa Illinois border. Um, okay. I have family on both sides of the river. It's called the Quad Cities. I, oh yeah. Some people yep. know it. Some people don't. Um, but it's the home of John Deere. It's a big enough radio market that people that work in radio are familiar with it. You yeah, know, maybe you, so. You hear of the Quad Cities market. Yes. You know, here and there. So it was probably my sophomore or junior year, I started part-time at uh, the group there. And this was before Clear Channel bought um, – bought into it. It was called Sconics Broadcasting. I, okay. th I think I still have the employee handbook for Sconics Ooh. Broadcasting. Ooh. It may be upstairs in a, in a, in a bin that is just. Are you, are you one of these people that holds on to way too many things from your past that you shouldn't hold on to? Honestly, no. Um, okay. But you happen to have that. Because okay. I, because in radio, you know, most people are moving every few years. You kind of yeah. learn to binge and purge what you really need to get rid of. Yeah. So I mean I have some relics of my past but not a ton. Um but anyway I was doing I was running um we were still pushing buttons and uh and uh CD carts and eight tracks for the uh for the commercials. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> uh I was running um uh, like Sunday morning programming. I I think I I don't remember if I did the weather I don't remember, but I know I was definitely running those those you know Country Countdown USA and sure um, uh, Crook and Chase, uh, all that sort of like and the Sunday morning religious stuff that would come in. Um, I was doing that for um, um, what is the the iHeart cluster now, which is WLLR, um, and uh, who else is in that building? Um, uh, Q one hundred six point five, uh, KMXG. Um, that's it, and that's that was like a. That's the dominant cluster in that market and has been forever. LLR yeah. pulls like 20 shares. It's ridiculous. That dovetailed into nights. This is all while I'm in high school. Okay, so I was just going to ask. So you're in high, you're high school age. Yeah, okay. I'm still in high school. As a, I was in a, in a program in high school called Diversified Occupations where you like get credit for going to work. Oh, wow. So every day I would I would walk into school with my sweater vest and my necktie because I was going to the radio station and it was a serious business. <laughs> <laughs> I was an intern for Jim O'Hara is basically what it was. Um, mm -hmm. And but that dovetailed into part time, and then I left for the military. Um, 
And then I came back from the military and went back to that cluster of radio stations. And it was right at that point that I decided that it was time to find a full-time gig. Um, yeah. Which is when I ended up. And that's when I kind of started to fall in love with imaging was at that first full-time gig, um, which was in Quincy, Illinois. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar, but I'll... I'll... <laughs> the, home, the home of broadcast electronics. Oh, okay. So we were kind of a dummy station for all of, like, Broadcast Electronics would bring us, like, here's here's some stuff that we have. Yeah, yeah, let's put it into action. Let us know what you think. I, I've had a, a few people on that have had those situations. Yeah. And um, so it was my first time to use automation and, and you know, all that sort of stuff. It was very early into the automation phase. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can remember the, the, the program director, like, so the... The radio station is kind of, it's kind of like three different parts. It's in this building, and I don't remember the name of the building off the top of my head, but it's like a senior living place upstairs in the apartments. And then there's like offices to the back, and then there's offices to the front, and then in the basement was all the production um, Mm. studios and stuff. And I can remember coming down the stairs and the program director like skipping four steps at a time, running up the stairs, because this automation was just firing randomly. (laughs) <laughs> just firing through elements. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it was, it was, but it was a great facility because it was when I really got to start to, to, to dive into like doing imaging and understanding the flow of imaging and, and all that sort of stuff. When, when you first did imaging, what were you working on? Like what DAW, a digital audio workstation for those? Just I think that might've been cool edit pro and maybe okay. even the early editions of saw. Um, I de- okay, it was that's... definitely cool at it, and I think that there was one room with Saw, and I don't I don't even remember the old versions of Saw, what they yeah. what they were called. Um, uh, Saw thirty two, Saw Saw Pro, Saw Plus. I think that I don't remember. If I, I, I use if that. I to think start about it. Also. I think that that the the waveform was green on it, and I remember it being way more in depth than Cool Edit. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, like I, the way that it the the multi track on it and all that stuff. Saw infuriated me, and I didn't know why yet because it was the first thing I ever did. You know, and I started because a flood happened. So they're like, "Yeah, everybody left. So you want to work here? Cool. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit." So they handed me saw. It hadn't even been installed. Anyway, when I got cool at it, that made sense to me. That that was like, oh, okay, all of this makes sense to me. Saw was infuriating. Yeah, the, you know, some. Cool Edit was just kind of the the go to thing, I think, because it was cheap for the radio stations. Yeah, and you could buy one license and and a lot of times put it on like four and five computers, <laughs> so everybody had a copy <laughs> of Cool Edit. I think I still well, have a Cool Edit CD. You honestly. mean Peter Peter Quistgard? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That's the copy that everybody had. <laughs> and then the salespeople <laughs> figured out that you could play Pong on it. Did you, you remember the back door to be able to play Pong on it? Yeah, yeah. So the salespeople <laughs> were like, uh, "Can I get a copy of that? My client wants yeah. me to." <laughs> and you know, they're at their desk playing Pong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, so let's uh, jump a bit. But you uh, got your you got your hands into the radio imaging world. As time moves forward from there, were you? Uh, what percentage of your life was producing imaging, and then you know anything else in radio, being on the air or other stuff? Honestly, not a ton because I I wasn't in Quincy very long before I moved to New Orleans and. That was when I kind of started the journey, the on-air journey, which was okay. nights, um, and then I produced the morning show um, at um, at the intercom cluster, and then I got fired, um, and 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 I I didn't really move too much in radio, honestly. Like I moved from like the Quad Cities to New Orleans, back to the Quad Cities, to Greensboro, to New Orleans, to Greensboro, to here. Oh, okay. So, so wait, but when you went into the military, is that what brought you to New Orleans? No. Uh, okay. My okay. uncle lived in New Orleans, and I came down so to you visit him. There. And um, I was like, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if I moved down here?" Like, you know, an eighteen-year-old kid, nineteen-year-old kid with like, you know, no qualms, uh, you know, like just kind of moving yeah. with the wind. He's yeah. like, "Yeah, sure, come on." So I moved on. To, I moved down. I didn't have a job or anything, um, and and kind of started fresh. Like I got part-time at, at the radio station, um, the intercom cluster, and then they opened up a night position. Uh, I, I, I like to think that they opened the nights because I was so good at what I did mm-hmm. um, that they 
saw a place where they could shoehorn me in and they made it happen. Um, and then I was in nights for probably a year and a half, um, really only doing nights. And then um, and the new program director came in, uh, John Roberts, and he moved me to mornings to produce the morning show. Uh, with It was Bo and Beth at the time. Um, and then as Bo and Beth's contract ended, um, there just wasn't a place for me anymore. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, and of course, you know, you make all those kind of rookie mistakes and um, yeah. that sort of stuff. So you kind of get your eyes open when you get fired the first time, examining why you got fired. Um, so when I left, when I left the, the radio stations in, in um, New Orleans, the first time I moved back home uh, to take a job as the midday guy at uh, B100 in the Quad Cities. And that was when I really dove into doing the imaging um, because I had watched so much of it in New Orleans. Um, we had, I was able to help kind of relaunch the station and freshen the voice up. And I was kind of the go to imaging guy. Um, and and, and at that time, I was kind of like, you know, I think I want to go into programming. Mm-hmm. Um, but then another opportunity presented itself, like right on the heels of me getting back in the Quad Cities to go to Greensboro and work with a brand new morning show there. So I kind of tickled this like programming, imaging, producer thing for a while. Um then I went to New Orleans. I did. That was when I decided I wanted to do programming. After I had done the morning show in Greensboro, I wanted to program. So I took an APD gig at um, at ninety two point three. It was Diva ninety two point three at the time in New Orleans, and I was kind of the the APD, and I helped with the imaging, and um, and then that station flipped uh, to Mix while I was still here, and that was when. I was kind of handed the keys to the imaging. We had Corley on. Um, we had Scott Shannon Consulting. We had the you know this brand new imaging library. We had um, uh, it just all the you know all the tools that we you could have when you launch a brand new station to get it off the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was when I really fell in love with imaging. And I was like, I don't think I want to play the politics of being a program director anymore. Um, so guys, I'm going to take this. And that was when I took my imaging gig in Greensboro. So I went, now I'm back in Greensboro for the second time. It, not to jump too far ahead, but I wanted to get we into should. some other things. <laughs> so let's, let's go get to where you're going to get into voiceover. Um, at, at what point, you know, what was happening in your job when you decided voiceover was something you were going to either focus on or, uh, maybe you were thrust into it, but where, when did that happen? So after I left New Orleans, I became the imaging director for the Clear Channel Cluster in Greensboro and Raleigh. So I had eight stations in two markets. Mm-hmm. And it was at that point that I really kind of dovetailed into knowing that voiceover was where I wanted to go. Although, like, looking way back now, I'm like, I kind of always wanted to work with my voice. That was where I kind of put the plan into action. Um, because I had eight stations in two markets, I always kind of had to work ahead. So we would write the copy, send it to the voice guy, and then, you know, we would wait for the voice guy to do it. So while we were waiting for the voice guy to do it, I would voice it and create the, create the shells of the imaging. Yeah. So I was able to get this multi-format experience voicing rock and country and top 40 and, uh, news talk and what else did we have? There was country in both markets. Anyway, so I was able to get all this multi-format experience and that was when I kind of started to use the connections that I was making inside of Clear Channel to say, hey, I'm available for this. If you need any help, mm-hmm. I'd love to be your guy. And I can produce it for you, too. So it was kind of that one-stop sales piece sure, sure. For, for these so, guys. So what was the first paid voiceover position then? Job, gig, whatever? Uh, it's a station I still have, actually. It's in, like, Jackson, Michigan. Okay. Itty bitty nice. teeny tiny market, uh, not too far from Detroit. Was it a Clear Channel station? No, it's not. Okay. I so ironically, ironically, even though you I, I sort of put yourself out there for that, you actually booked a non-Clear Channel station. I don't. First. I don't even know who it. I don't even know who owns it. To be honest, it was. It came through Benstown, because um, it was early on in the Benstown uh, when they so, when they first launched too. So 
Yeah, ballpark a time frame here now. So, so what about what year is this? Where uh, you? Yeah. <laughs> um, they, you told me there'd be no math involved in this podcast. Well, I don't know if that's math. I'm just asking you to tell me a year you booked a station, <laughs> Neil. I'm not sure if we're counting that as math. Um, probably 2008, 2007, 2008, something like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that that'd be the very beginning of Benstown. Yeah. 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 It was very early on. Um, it, it's you know not a ton of money. It's one of those. It's one of those sort of stations where you go. This is the first station I was ever on, and it's really, really cool to still, you know, ten, ten plus years now to be able to say, guys, we've been able to grow together. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think I actually still produce um, not the very first station that I booked, but maybe the second or third. Yeah. And that was since um, oh oh five. Or wow. 06. Yeah, but those are, you know, those are great. And you just, you know it so well. And you, you know, you know the people so, uh, so well. Yeah. And there's something to be said for, from the, from a voice talent standpoint, to be able to like grow and morph, you know, cause I'll be honest, I was not very good when I started. And I'm probably not as good now as I'm going to be 10 years from now. And, you know, mm, yeah. it's sort of the growth. Well, maybe so you're different. You yeah, know, maybe, different. Maybe yeah, we exactly. say you're different. Yeah, a little more life experience. So you're right. able to grow with this station. Um, and it's it's really cool to to kind of look back at that process. Yeah. And, let, uh, let, let me push you ahead a little bit to when you went uh, full time with your voiceover career. How did that transpire? Uh, it was pink and it was handed to me in an envelope. Yeah. Well, I kind of assumed that would be the answer, but I didn't want to. So you were you were one of the many people that were um, sort of pushed into your career, and you. So, I yeah. I had ma- I had enough of a of a of a stable of side work to be able to leave radio when I was handed my uh, my official notice to leave. Yeah, and I probably just would have never jumped off of the. You, know, you needed to be pushed. I kind of needed to be pushed. I liked. I don't want to say that I necessarily liked it. My wife wanted to move back to, she's from this area of the country in Louisiana, and um, she wanted to come back home. So I had, I had come back here. I was able to, to retain the work in, in um, Greensboro and Raleigh. So I was still doing that. And then I took like a, basically a part-time gig here at the, the iHeart Cluster in, um, in Baton Rouge, basically running the board for the morning show. So it's sort of like this full circle. Like I started yeah. running the board yeah. and then I got out running the board. Um, and it, I like not as soon as I was handed the pink slip, I got on the phone with the guys in Greensboro and Raleigh and said, guys, can we continue this relationship? FYI, I just got rift. Redu- I was a reduction right. in workforce. Sure. Um, and they were like, absolutely, no problem. We would love to, you know, we like what you do for us. I don't know why they would, they, we don't understand why you got let go because apparently they didn't look at what, nonetheless, I was able to hold on to that work. Right. And then it's just kind of been this steady snowball of. And what what year was that, if you don't mind? just 20, again for 2011. The, Actually, okay. we were building a house at the time. And I was like, guys, I just built a house. Like, what do you want me to, like, you're going to fire yeah. me and I just built mm-hmm. a house? Um. <laughs> But, but that was care. a well, no, and I mean it's you know capitalism, and it's fine, and, right? And you're you're fine for it, but um, the yeah, and you were part time though at that point. Yeah, sorta. Um, I I was considered a full time employee, but I was really only working like running the morning show board and then leaving. So you were like a four in the door board op. Basically. I was a four in the door full time board op. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cush. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah it's hard. <laughs> but I was still doing the imaging under that under that um yeah for greensboro and raleigh which they ended up having to outsource to me when everything was said and done they i mean they saved money in the end i get it you know as from from a business standpoint sure you hate to see people out of work but you know i get it yeah absolutely so so uh 2011 ish is when you're uh you know thrust into your full-time voiceover career um I still have kind of a big list, but just just at the beginnings there, um, like you had already said, you had you had plenty of, of of stations and you know your own sort of side work, I guess is what you would have considered it before then. Right. What was it scary? Did you feel pretty comfortable from Jump Street? Of course, you also said you were building a house, so that was, you know, what was the mindset when that happened? You know the 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 mindset when I first was thrust into 
voiceover or, or you know, doing my being an entrepreneur really yeah. was all I need is enough money to make enough money that I can afford to pay my mortgage. We didn't have kids at the time. Um, so my goal every month was just make enough to pay the mortgage. Right. Um, and I think, you know, from a, from, from a performance standpoint that, that comes across pushed, right? You, you, you know, if you really, really want something, um, <clears throat> from the, from the performance standpoint, it probably sounded like, oh, you know, an, you know, a closed fist receives nothing. Yeah. So it, if you're, you're clenched and you're tight and, you know, it just, yeah. um, it was, it was not very relaxing. It was, it was very stressful. Um, and, and you're kind of, I'm kind of learning a whole new industry at the same time, right? Because I don't know how to be an entrepreneur. I just know that I want to voice things. And, um, and, um, uh, d- so I was, it was a lot of trying to find my way and going, okay, I just need to make, you know, X number of dollars a month so that I can pay my mortgage. It's kind of still sure. like that though, too. I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing's changed. And now weird. I just have two it's kids. Just, right, you just, the, the mortgage is larger, and then there are basically two other mortgages that run around and dirty your house, I guess. Right. Um, now, I've got to talk about your studio build. So uh, you, tell me about that. You've built your own studio. Where is it in the house or actually attached to the house or, or detached? And when did that build happen? So when the house that we built when I got fired... We were able to make some money on that on the back end. And when we went searching for a new place, um, <clears throat> this was one of the houses that we that we came to see. And it has, it's a 12 by 18, essentially a shed in the back yeah. that the old owner who was here before, um, he put it in and it was like his workshop. He had like, you know, drill presses and welding machines and all that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I saw it as an opportunity to gut the thing. Mm-hmm. And turn it into a to an office space without taking up a whole extra room in the house. So I gutted it, and I have a buddy who's a builder, and I caught him at just the right time. It was the end of the year; not a lot of stuff was going on, um, and I kind of had this vision for what it was because I had built the the studio in my other house before, and um, yeah, it's just kind of my vision and and his craftsmanship kind of turned it into what it is. Um, um, and, and just so I, I didn't, I meant to say this before I got into this topic, um, you've provided me the link, which I've put on the post for this podcast, um, about the build of that studio. You've also given me some nice pics of it so people can see, um, if anybody hasn't already guessed, it has a theme. <laughs> Gee whiz, Neil, <laughs> what could the theme possibly be for your studio? It's my fan quarters. I mean, it's, it's all my Niner stuff. <laughs> um, the, the inside of your booth is kind of a cross between uh, San Francisco colors, but also like like meters going up and down. What was I seeing there? Yeah, so the I saw something on Pinterest where it was the um, it's the ATS acoustic boards, right? And they're uh-huh. cut into little squares that yep. that look like a VU meter. So the yes. back wall of my of my booth is kind of meant to look like a VU meter in red and gold. Red being the 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 peaks and levels. And, yeah. and gold being the the dead space. Yeah, it's cool. I like that. Well, I, but I do. I actually like that you took the uh, the soundproof the the panels and then repurposed them for that look that you have there. I do uh, not I, advise that doing that though. No, okay. It was a total <laughs> pain in the ass. I mean, I I cut all of these to a specific size, and then I had to cut all the burlap, and then I had to to spray. Um, 3M spray on it. Yeah. Like yep. it, it spray adhesive. So your hands are just covered in this sprayed, in, you know, this compressed insulation. Mm-hmm. And there's got to be, there might be, there might Hundreds, be, there, right? there's hundreds, there might be 200 of them. Yeah. I employed my wife to help and my dad, and they're bitching the whole way through it. And I'm like, guys, I know this is my yeah. vision. Okay. Once right. it's up, it's up. <laughs> yeah, once it's up, it's up. Until we get a new house, I need to build a new studio. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think we're moving anytime soon. I, yeah. As a matter of fact, my wife and I have talked about moving, and I was like, you know, I I just don't want to build a new studio. I really love this space. Yeah, and and you know that's key. And and I'm I'm in here eight hours, nine hours, ten hours a day. So I gotta yep. love it. 
I hope people go and check out the link. To be totally honest, I, I saw tons of content about your studio build. I liked it. I, d- I haven't even clicked the link you sent me yet, though. Um, I walked through basically every phase of what I did. Excellent. Uh, Does it have a time frame on there? I, I can't remember no, how long I don't it took think you. I, I, we did it in about three or four weeks. Again, oh, wow. that's, that's because my buddy was a builder and he was yeah. like between jobs. It was the end of the year. We really lucked out. I yeah. actually had a session like we were we were just putting glass up and I have these big panes of glass and we mm-hmm. we were able to put up one layer of glass and I was like, I got to do this session. I got to do it. Um, <laughs> and I, I was like, I took some old just I, basically I was like it was like soundproofing a hotel room. Uh, just to do this session to make to make it happen like the studio wasn't even done yet and I was booking gigs so it was mm-hmm. it was already uh, moving in the into the black quickly did you consult um, an engineer for the actual you know for the acoustical elements um, you know the angles and, and actually having that big ass piece of glass but all that did you actually consult one or yeah you- George George Whittem helped a, a, a little bit um, probably more than I realize um, because he can he can take kind of the vision of a of the crazy vision of a creative sure. and and relay it to the builder in kind of builder terms mm-hmm. and he also had a lot of really good ideas for like in the wall I have a like a snake plate that snakes through the wall so that I can plug in the microphones and it's just sure. it literally looks like a like it was meant to be there mm. um, so he was able to help me track down some of those sort of specialty items like he kind of knows where that those things can be found. Uh, my final question on that, and again, since I didn't click the link yet, I don't think you put it there, but uh, would you give us a, a general cost of what a build like that was? Is that something you're comfortable telling us? Um, sure. And keep in mind that I got kind of the friend discount on uh, on the builder. Um, so let's, let's then assume, you know, the, the general labor, labor cost is going to be less for Neil than it would for others. But I think people would be interested to know, because I think he did a bang up job and uh, it looks extremely custom, which is obvious because of your buddy. But yeah, to know the general budget. Yeah, I think I budgeted 10 grand for it, but it came in at 18. I think it was something like that. Okay. But also yeah. remember that the building was already here. So yep. if you were to have to put a like I've got I've got the the whole studio insured for for I think it's 50 grand added on to your homeowners? <clears throat> no, it's a whole separate policy. Oh, you have a separate policy for it. Okay. Something weird that people may not know is when you have a a built an exterior building, you'd have to check and talk to your insurance person, but for mine because this building is used for quote unquote business. Right. It can't fall under a home it's a gray area of the homeowners where they could like deny it because it's not a shed which would be covered right right um, but it would be covered for much much less <clears throat> yeah because business is done out of this building yeah it's some weird caveat so i was able to get a lloyd's policy which i probably pay too much for but it's kind of peace of mind if you know sure. a tree or something were to a tornado or something where i would cry like a little girl oh my god yeah it, it, like it, if this, if anything in this studio, like ever, I sometimes I lay it in bed at night and go, oh, I hope nothing's happening in this studio. Like, <laughs> I love it. I really love this space. <laughs> it's really nice. It really is. Um, and I see people uh, post pictures of the studio spaces, especially when they're building something custom. It's always fun. It's you know that's kind of the the pinnacle of sort of making it in this business when you get to afford to build something nice. Um, the microphone in the picture you sent is not the microphone you use. And in fact, I emailed you. I'm like, dude, what is that mic? Is that a blah, blah, blah? And you're like, no, it's a, it's a paperweight now. But anyway. yeah, it's actually, I, I just grabbed it. It's, it's a Charter Oak E700, um, which is a large diaphragm mic. Yeah. And, um, George Whittem turned me on to it. Um, I've kind of just, I kind of just use the 416 on a regular basis, um, for it, for its obvious reasons that many people have discussed on this podcast, but yeah, the the Charter Oak E seven hundred is is a really pretty pretty uh, mic in pictures. So I yeah. kind of dangled it in front. Of it. <laughs> it does no. Well, I think I was thinking it could have been a forty seven. I wasn't. I just couldn't see it. I didn't zoom into the picture. But no, yeah. it's a small company. Um, and 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 actually, the owner. Um, I I think I have another Charter Oak mic in the house. It's just in the box. It's one of his tube mics. 
Um, yeah. But this is a this is a really great little little condenser mic, or not really little. It's kind of a chunky condenser microphone, but um, it sounds great. I so, just, are you on the four sixteen need... right now, though? As as we are all hearing you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you What do you do with your four sixteen and your mic chain? How, what, you know, what do you add on if you're recording? You know, pre- relative. Let me let me try asking this again. <laughs> if you're recording clean voiceover. Uh, what does your chain look like? So I use the uh, the Universal Audio Apollo. Um, as a matter of fact, my Apollo is sold. It's it's the gray version, uh, the gray rack mount version. Yeah, I uh, actually have that. Um, so I have the uh, Avalon uh, 737 plug-in, which is a, a newer plug-in um, from uh, Universal Audio. Oh, you just got that? I almost pulled the trigger on it. Did you get it on sale? <clears throat> I don't think I did. It? I think it went on sale like right after I bought it. They have a two plug in sale going on right now. I was thinking of buying that and another one, and thus I would get the Avalon at like 125 bucks. That's worth it. It's really a good plug in. Is it really? But and you know the thing is the the the, the plugins everybody kind of just is to each his own, right? Do you want to yeah. drive a Ford or a Chevy? Yeah. Um. It it's all it's kind of personal preference, really. Um, I can make the Avalon sound ex- exactly the same as the Appy Vision tr- channel strip, which I used um, as mm-hmm. well. But I've kind of like fallen fallen in place with this Avalon since I got it dialed in and sounding good. And then um, George uh, Whittem, um, he had me add a little LA-2A um, mm-hmm. to, the very, yeah. to the very end. And sometimes I'll work with studios who are like, hey, uh, are you running any compressor yeah. or limiter or whatever on there? And, and then I'll turn it off. It, but, you know, to the untrained ear, you can't even hear it. And it just, it adds a nice little thickness and richness there that you go, oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I could see, you know, your radio clients enjoying it. It gives them a little more beef to work with. And maybe um, commercial, like you said, the, the creative studios might be, ugh. Yeah, and for the radio yeah, stuff, I send I send a processed file to all my radio stations anyway, because um, most so of the something times, with a lot of extra stuff. Do do you send yeah. them? Sorry, I just totally jumped on you, but I do this and others do. Do you send them clean and dry, and then also a thickly filtered file, or you just send them the one? No, I send them the um, the processed file. Um, so literally, all they have to do is add effects to it. Sure, and it was just something that I developed. When I was still an imaging director, right. Um, so now I just process my voice for them. I do, and have you a f- do that in the box. So yep. you're saying you're not doing it on? Okay, so you're doing it in the box after you print through the chain you just described. Yeah, it's literally normalize number four, normalize again, and I'm done. Like I have hotkeys set up for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but I have some that don't want any processing. Right. Um, I would prefer to send it processed because I, I know how it's going to cut through on the air. Yeah. Um, and that's more of just kind of my personal preference. But, I mean, I'm, you know, whatever. You're, I'll send it to them however they want it if they ask we've, for it. We've talked about this on this show about the sort of protecting the way you sound on the air depending on the skill level of the producer or just, you know, voice it, send it, and forget it and let them air it how they want. Yeah, I mean, you know, because, again, I want any any potential future people to to like what they hear as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, there's kind of, it's kind of not just the station that I'm on do I want them to sound good because I know how to process my voice, but also anybody who may be driving through any given market and hear right. what I'm doing. Um, TV I don't obviously process um, as heavily as I would for radio. Like radio is just a ton of compression and, re- you know, you really, really g- give it a, a nice gritty sound. But yeah, the TV stuff, I don't. What about when you audition? Um, so I would assume the rules are similar. TV, you're really not going to touch it too much. They they legitimately want to hear pretty clean stuff. And, and, you know, just listen to the TV and listen to radio. It sounds totally different. But anyway, when you audition for anything radio or what what are you doing to your audition files so radio i'm going to i'm going to send it as if it were processed um okay i want them to hear exactly what it potentially would sound like if you hire me um sometimes i even produce the radio stuff that i send out mm-hmm. the auditions um just so they can hear kind of the f- 
the full to do. I mean, because think about it, like on the local level anymore these days, it's like the program director who's producing the imaging. Very few people have the luxury of having an, an in-house imaging guy. Um, or, or even someone just focused on it, even if they're not in-house. Right, I even even mean. a retainer guy. I mean, that's just... Right. Um, so I try to give them kind of the complete picture of what this will sound like on your airwaves um, when I audition. Does it help? I don't know. Does it hurt? I, I'd like to think not. Um, this is going to lead me to this, I think, kind of, maybe possible good segue. What is the most important element in general to your business for booking new work? Relationships. Okay. Yeah, think about think about how many jobs go to people who have a they know the guy. Hey, he's a cool guy. Let's hire him. Yeah. Sometimes it's not not even sometimes it's like fitting a you know from a from a creative standpoint it's a square peg in a round hole, but because they have the relationship, it, the relationship is so important. My agents talk about it all the time. Yeah. That's interesting. Um I did want to mention your website. Uh you, you how old is the the design you have right now? Neilwilson.com. Uh we just we just I just relaunched it. Like it just okay. it's less than a year old. Um, yeah. I, uh, tell me about it. How important is the website to your to your uh to booking or to just your your uh business in general? Uh, I think it paints a picture of who you're hiring. Um it gives the it's it's fun. I mean, that was mm-hmm. kind of the one of the things that we wanted to focus on. Um, in the rebrand, Maurice Tobias helped me rebrand it. Um, she was instrumental. She she actually found the little like dude yelling at the TV, and she's like, "Honestly, if you don't like this, I'm gonna I'm gonna fly to Baton Rouge and I'm gonna smack you around." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then my web guy was able. We were able to come up with the color scheme. Obviously, it's 49ers colors. Um, but it literally is like it's a picture of who you are hiring. Um, right. You kind of know what you are gonna get when you see just that landing page. So, um, again, it's one of those things that like, do, do people who don't understand branding get it? Probably not. Do people who get it, get it? Yeah, probably so. So, you know, it's, it's, it's subjective for me. I think it works. I think it paints a good picture of who I am. And a lot of these questions I ask, cause, um, I'll get hit up by, you know, sort of, uh, new, people, whether they're working or not, but they're, you know, how do I get started or what, you know, all these questions get asked. Uh, As far as a website for a voice actor, I kind of know the answer, but I want your opinion. How important is having a website? And then um, what, what should your expectations be from your website as far as actually getting work? Um, I think a website's very important. Um, It's, it's like a, it's like a business card, right? So you can, Mm -hmm. you, you can put, samples of stuff that you do on a regular basis up there. Um, I have, uh, like little blog posts and stuff that I do. Um, I think it's, you know, the, the internet is real estate and the more real estate you can own, the more likely you are to be found, especially if you under start to understand SEO and mm-hmm. how people are searching. Um, what was the, what was the backside what? of the question? Well, I, it's it's funny because even you know monstrous talent still don't have websites, and I'm kind of surprised by that sometimes. But then sometimes you're like, eh, maybe they don't need one, and and then you know new people in the industry or people that are looking to get into the industry often will kind of start with demos or being on a P two P site. They don't have coaching and they don't have a website. And in your opinion, you know how important is having that web presence for a new person? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I you know, the first step for any new person, I would say, is work with a coach and work with a coach a lot because you're not very good. Even if you think you're great. You're, and even if people tell you you're good, you're not very good. Just because you have a good voice doesn't make you a good voice actor. Um, you know, if, I would say a, a website is a piece of the plan. I don't think it's the end-all, be-all of the plan. I think it's kind of like, <clears throat> you know, one of the... I'm trying to think of the best way to explain it. Like it's just kind of a piece. It's it's like a, it's another piece of the puzzle that you can put together at some point, point. Um, and they're not cheap. So you've got to be very smart with your money as you work through building, um, growing, and maintaining a voiceover career. And there's just so many levels that, yeah. You know, I just think starting with a coach is really the yeah. best place to start. Um, mm, yeah, uh, definitely. 
Um, let's see here. Are, we, I guess I already know the answer to this. I like to think in terms of like tech savviness. Uh, it's always good when you know voice actors can also kind of be their own tech support. Um, I guess you're pretty tech savvy. Do you have anything else to add about how people can sort of control their own destiny in their studio? Uh, yeah, one, if it works, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so the the whole if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had a, I had an issue where I updated something on my um, uh, software update. One of my yeah. software updates, and it reset <laughs> all of my settings. And I I <clears throat> I had a I think I was sick or something, and I had this session. So I'm go- like I'm in the back of the room going, <laughs> and I have this I have a button that I can click where I can just turn off my mic feed set up in the Apollo. So I didn't re I was pushing the button. I would hack my lungs out and then I would get ready for the next take. So I caught the tail end of the delay on one of the, on, on the other end with the engineer and it's me hacking, hacking up a lung. Yeah. So we get, and you're like, with- well, he wasn't supposed to hear that. How's <laughs> yeah. that coming back to me? <laughs> so we get done with the session and I'm like, um, did you guys hear me hacking up a lung? I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm dealing blah, blah, blah. It was, oh, yeah, yeah, I just muted it. It's fine. So luckily the engineer kind of had my back on that, but I'm like, it was so embarrassing. And it was all because of a software update that I did that I didn't realize it was taking away that muting function and like reset everything to these, these defaults. So... So, so if somebody wants to learn a little more about, you know, just getting a little more savvy with the technology in their studio, in your opinion, without having to spend money, I'm assuming, you know, there's plenty of stuff on, well, I, I know there's stuff on YouTube, but, but how would you say to go about it? What are some steps they can take to just learn a little about what's happening in their studio? Play with it off hours. I mean, try and mess it up and then fix it. Um, have somebody yeah. that you can call. Um, that maybe talked you into the software or going back to your relationships, tip right? About right. having those good um, relationships. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't want to make it sound like a commercial for George Whittem, but he, the dude, knows his stuff, um, and he knows all the software from a voiceover standpoint. And he can actually log into your computer and like do it for you, so you can see it being done and screen cap it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Team Viewer, something like that. They use. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of you know for me, I. <laughs> Even outside of the studio, I'm kind of a tinkerer. Um, I like to, like, I can, the other day I was, like, changing a part on my wife's car. Um, I, I, I look at all those sort of things as, like, creative outlets for me. Um, so if you're a tinkerer, tinker around. Just, you know, don't do it before a session. Sure. <laughs> where you might need to mute a cough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it is, you know, breaking something is the, and, and fixing it. <laughs> Hopefully you can figure out how to fix it. But remember is the how best you w- fixed it. That's the most yeah, important exactly. part. Exactly. The best way to learn how something works, though, is to... Um, and again, I want to move us along here. We're already getting towards the end, and I know you actually probably have to work. But attending conferences, I, I know that you get out to quite a few of them. We already made reference to CRS and Station Summit, and then you talked about Pro Max. Um, I guess I would ask you from just a strictly the voiceover point of view, what do you attend and why? Um, I like to, I like to put my money where it's the, the maximum value, right? So I like, I'm not going to go to, and again, everybody's different, but I'm, I'm just not going to go to like voiceover conferences, um, because I don't see that there's a lot of buyers there. Um, you have to identify what your target market is. Like if it's e-learning, then go to where the e-learning people are. If it's commercial, go to the, you know, where the commercial producers are. Um, I I do a lot of promos and radio and, and uh, TV affiliates. So I go to where those buyers are so that I can grow those relationships, uh, maintain those relationships and nurture those relationships and maybe make some new relationships along the way. Um It just comes back to like spending your money smartly, right? Yeah. Um, Obviously, don't go to those until you're ready. I mean, those are another facet of growing your career. Um, But uh, yeah, for me, it's just about putting my money where I think that there's the most potential return. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, I'm trying to think if I have yet to... I don't think I've gone to specifically a voiceover conference. They, For all the reasons you said... 
I've never found one to show me value. But And listen, that's not to say that there isn't value for some people who are, who right. are getting started, like learning, learning some things like, you know, like I use a CRM, right? So, um, and I track every job I've ever done in the history of my CRM. I have a, I have a tally of who sent me what or whatever. So there are things like at those voiceover conferences where you can actually meet with other voiceover talent and understand how they run their business. So there, there is value to that, but long term, is it something you want to do every year? And sure. maybe, maybe not after the first few years. Um, but sometimes, I think what I was getting to is sometimes you just have to take a swing at them, though. Because, you know, for me, I eventually will probably go to a, a very voiceover-centric conference. Sometimes it's hard knowing which one is the right one. Oh, Absolutely. And the same thing, same thing with coaches. The first coach yes. you work with might not be yes. the one for you. The second or third or fourth might not. But there's, there's, there's a never-ending cycle of 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 conferences and that sort of stuff. You just yes. kind of have to hone in on which one is the best one for you and growing your business. Um, since we kind of we just talked about you know the whole asking people how they do stuff, you brought up CRM, and you're clearly a pretty. You're, I think you're a power user. How do you use your CRM? You, you know, is is it a manual like manual labor all the time, constantly? <clears throat> it's a step. Data? It's a step in the wheel. So, um, kind of the workflow is when a job shows up, it goes into the CRM as a <clears throat> either a job I need to do. Um, um, I track my auditions. I track my bookings. So you track every audition. Every audition that comes in, you put into the CRM? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's manual, right? I mean, you have to actually enter that sir, for every single uh, one. Yeah, I've actually asked myself, um, why am I keeping this data? But I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure the day will come where... There's a, phone, there's a phone call or, um, oh, well, for instance, like, you know, my agents will call when contracts are coming up and go, hey, how is the workflow on this? And I can go back and look and say, well, they sent on this date and they sent on this date and here's how mm-hmm. many they've sent in the last year. Um, so I, I know what kind of power user they are of my services, um, which helps from a, I guess, from a negotiating standpoint, I, that would be more of an agent question, how they use that data sure. to negotiate. But I keep all that data. <laughs> why? I, I mean, you know, who well, knows? Well, like I was just saying, someday you might figure out why you kept it all. You know, But it I also might... target, like, I keep my contact lists in there. Um, mm-hmm. I keep a prospects list for people that I'd like to work with. So anybody that I've made communication with through the, through the, um, networking channels at, at um, you know, the CRSs or Promaxes or the conferences or how do you, whatever. Yeah, how do you do that? What's your what's your process for that? You go to a conference, like we went, we were at Station Summit together this, this past June. Um, we each met plenty of people. It was way more in your sphere than me, so it was actually super relaxing for me because I don't do the affiliate work like you. You just gambled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hung out with you guys. I had some beverages. I did some gambling. No, but it was great, though, because it was f- interesting to meet these other types of, of buyers, as you say. But anyway, when you're there, what's your process like to sort of uh, you know, download what you got from that conference? When do you do it? How do you do it? And what do you do with it later? You know, there's a fine line between being annoying and being persistent. Um, so, you know, you make the you make the connection, you get the card, you send a follow up email, and then you can kind of gauge like what their interest was uh, or is. Um, sometimes they will hold on to an email saying, "Hey, it was great to meet you at Station Summit for two or three years." Yeah, like, I had one come through that was like three years old. Hey, we hung out at Station Summit and whatever, you know, we have this thing that came up because a lot of times the jobs aren't, the job is somebody else's until it's not, right? Um, so sure. that's why that's where those relationships are so important. So I just track um, kind of how often I reach out to them, what the gist of why I reached out. Um, I don't reach out just for the sake of reaching out. Um, it always, there always has to be a reason to reach out. Um, sure. So you're not just sending, hey, how's it going? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, I have I have marketing platforms where I do send like kind of blanket stuff, but it's always around something. And I try to add some value in that in that sort of marketing to the end user. Like, hey, have you tried this processing setting? Um, for Thanksgiving, I did like a happy Thanksgiving to my to my list of um to my campaign list. And then I said, here's how I smoked my turkey this, this Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, 
So, cool. I mean, as long as there's some value there, um, you know, How? the PDs are just bombarded, bombarded with emails about hire me, hire me, hire me. For sure. Um, and you just, you know, that's where the CRM kind of helps me make sure that I'm not overdoing it. Um with um, those prospects. How often do you send, you know, that sort of that type of an email campaign to your to your list? A lot more during the holidays because there's there's so many packed together. But sure. um, I'll send one for like the Fourth of July. Um, I'll send one for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, I don't send one for the New Year because people just you know. It's sort of like listening habits change. So did email checking habits. People are checked out at that time. For sure. Um, and then I have an assistant who reaches out on a regular basis um, with work that, <clears throat> you know, either making those new connections or, you know, reaching out to people who have hired me in the past and saying, hey, you know, we haven't talked to you in a while. Um, marketing is just, it's so important. Um, I think Josh Goodman was saying, what what was the 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 it was like 60% marketing, 30% something, and like 10% voiceover or something. It's it's really true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That might have been Goodman. I know I have the Pete Gustin interview in my head a little more fresh, and uh, I think he was basically 50% of his time is spent on marketing. It's crazy, man. You spend more time chasing down the work and, and actually auditioning for the work than you do actually doing the work. And that's tough yeah. to grasp for somebody like me who was just fired and, hey, find your – here, find your way. Um, so you make some mistakes along the way, and you, you, I don't think anybody's a master at it, but, you know, you kind of do what you got to do to to pay your mortgage every month. And I, I don't think I've mentioned this before, and I don't know if it's something you do, but uh, perhaps getting onto the lists or getting into the, the sphere of other VO talent, especially ones you respect, people that you think do great work – and and kind of become see them as a customer or a client might see them. Yeah, you know, having as I think we talked about this before too is just having a core nucleus of people that you can rely on that do what you do um, yeah. outside of the Facebook groups. Um, yeah, we talked about that uh, off the air. By oh the yeah, way. yeah. Well, yeah. you know, having kind of <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. For a few reasons, I don't know if I was but to talk keep about going. Um, no, 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 but, keep you know, going. I, I have a core group of people that I can call on, and we can talk about the business, and they have their ear on the floor. I have my ear on the floor, and we kind of compare notes. Um, so you kind of, kind of have, you kind of have to have that at any level. Um, but yeah, you know, and you know, it makes sure it's people you trust, obviously. But right, right. Um, there's there's groups and these sort of. Um, I've been invited to. I don't know what the right word is like a weekly meetup to, but it's not people I trust. So I feel like there's certain people that are only looking to angle you and I don't, I'm not a rube, you know, I'm not going to get angled. So yeah, people like you and you know, just people like you, as long as you can trust them, then they're super valuable. So yeah. valuable. Yeah. You'll, you'll, it's one of those trial and error things. You'll get burned yeah. a couple times and then you'll go, okay, yeah. I can definitely trust this person or I can, I dev- I'm not so sure about this one. That's and a good I way think to put I, it. I think yeah. I'm kind of on the other side of like, uh, you know, people see me and they're like, oh, what's he going to do to me? <laughs> Which is never <laughs> the case. <laughs> yeah, no, it took me like two or three years to find out that maybe you weren't going to, um, <laughs> you know, damage my world in some way, that you were trustworthy. I'm coming perhaps. for you, Dreen. I'm coming yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, let me, let me get, I got to hit one more thing. We've gone long here, but, you know, people can punch out when they want to punch out. But I want your opinions on representation and management you know, and, and other people that work for you, not necessarily coaches. Um, I guess, what, what are your expectations from agents in your career? Um, you know, I just like the opportunities. Um, for me, it's about having somebody on my, I'm kind of a yes man. So I, actually, I really am. I'm, I'm terrible at negotiating. Uh, I'm terrible at saying no. So if somebody calls me and says, hey, will you do this? I'll be like, um, I'll feel conflicted. So mm-hmm. it gives me yeah. the, it gives me the ability to have somebody who's who's on my team that understands the rates, understands um, um, how to negotiate, um, can say no for me. I, I was gonna right the ability to say no is yeah. probably number one. Um, Lady Gaga, who you may be surprised to know, I'm a big fan of, said that I'm uh, not surprised at all. Actually, continue. I, I saw her. Um, in an interview and she said that when she learned the the power of the word no 
it changed the whole trajectory of her career. So having somebody on my side that understands the power of no um, really helps me. Um, they also can be a sounding board, um, mm-hmm. somebody that I can call and yell at or I can call and say, I don't understand why this is happening. Can you educate me because of their years in the business? Um, we know which agent you know is the helpful one and the one you can't yell at, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um you know, but, just Neil yeah. and I are represented by the same agency. So, so anyway. yeah, I mean, I th- I just think they're key in, in growing a long-term career. And they also provide really, like, major opportunities um, that, that you just well, may not see on, like, a P2P or, like, you know, find on your own. So uh, when, when younger folk or new folk are thinking, you know, I want an agent, I want an agent, but they don't really know what they do, it, it isn't literally to start handing you paid jobs. It, but, but the biggest feature for me, especially when I signed with Atlas, was just not just the amount of opportunities, but the types of opportunities and the, the things that I booked, I, I would never even had an audition with. Right, right. Much and, less. And there's some stuff that you'll book that you didn't even audition for, and those are the best jobs. Yeah, when they just show up, hey, look, they they hired you uh, from a demo. You're like, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Bob yeah. Bergen actually had a had a. Um, I think he said that he took a class in being an agent. Like he went to school to learn how to be an agent to understand what the agent does. Mm-hmm. Because we live in a vacuum. I mean, I'm in a I'm in a you know a room that I can barely stretch my arms all the way out in. Yeah. I don't know what's happening in New York at the New York office or L. I I mean, I know what's happening this week. They're preparing to shut down for the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? There's still auditions coming in. So, you know, it, 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 they, they, they kind of have their ears to the ground as well. And when you talk about those people on your team and your, your trusted people, those, those are very much trusted people um, for any for any talent um, that's with an agency is just know that you can reach out to them and say, guys, I need I need help. I need advice. I need you to tell these people no. I need you to negotiate a better rate. I need mm-hmm. to understand this and that. And there's a, they, they provide so much value for, for the money that they take from us or for the money that they bill us, I guess. I agree. Yep. I agree completely. Um, let me ask you one more thing before I ask my final question. Uh, for the holidays, I don't think I've asked this before. As a sole proprietor, you know, someone who runs his own business, that he is the product. Do you uh, do you shut down for this period of time? Are you always working? How, how do you handle the holiday season here? So I am officially out of the studio for the holidays. Unofficially, I'm kind of softly a veil. If you're going to dangle money in front of my face. Sure. So what does that mean you're officially out? Like you're starting now already or when does that <laughs> no, start? Um, so uh, I'll shut down the, the – I try to always shut down the week between Christmas and New Year's. Okay. There's never a lot going on. People are on the road. They're in holiday mode. Um, it's not TV sweeps. So none of the TV stations are doing – You know, L.A. shuts down. Um, I think the SAG after offices or, or something – I think they shut down like Thursday for the rest of the year. And you know what? You kind of need that. You need to unplug. Mm -hmm. Um, Last year was the first time that I completely just turned everything off and said, I'm taking my family on a vacation. We're going out of the country. You will not hear from me until I'm back in the U.S. And uh, it was glorious. It It takes me about a day and a half, two days to be like, okay. I'm not like it's okay. I'm I'm not going to check my email. Nobody's going to die. Yeah. Um, But I'm kind of always thinking about what's next. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. Cut that out. That's me coughing. Um, (laughs) I yeah. I'm kind of always thinking about what's next. So while I'm, I was at I was in Jamaica last year, so it was easy to unplug. But like this year, I'm just home and my dad's here. So you know I. I'm here without being here, but I'm I understand. still here. You're, you're not completely removed, so your brain can't completely disengage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yes and no. Um, it's easy to dis- disconnect, but I think you absolutely need it. Um, one of my it, friends in the business says you have to disconnect. If you yeah. don't disconnect, you will drive yourself crazy. Yeah, and, and it's, been, it's come up on this podcast a few times before, but, but really I, th- I think it's the TV affiliate work that locks you down more than anything. <clears throat> yeah, they grind um, you like five five months out of the year, and it's yeah. it's you're you're cuffed. 
Yeah. So, well, cool, man. All right, let, let me get the the final answer here. Um, you know, I'll let, I'll leave it open. I was going to sort of put you in a box on your advice for new people. <laughs> I was going to try to say, you know, if like you've just been fired from your job, you know, now what's your advice? But really, just just leave it wide open. Uh, those that are looking to get started out, you know, they're fresh in the voiceover business. What if you have to break down everything we said today? What's the the biggest piece of advice? Never give up. Okay. Is that is that good enough? <laughs> there, I kind of assumed you would expand on that, but um, I like it. No, you know, listen, you can do anything that you – it's the same thing I tell my six-year-old. <clears throat> you can do anything that you're willing to put the work into doing, right? Um, Bill Walsh, to bring it back to the 49ers, has a, has a saying that says champions behave like champions before they're champions. Mm. So understanding the kind of the, the subtext of that um, – is um is important because you know if you're i think that i think the quote kind of just sums itself up it does um, I, think, I think it does i think it's a great quote uh you know if, you, if you're willing to put in the work and behave like a champion then you will get there um it's a long process by all means i mean i still feel like it could be more and and i feel like i'm in a good place but i always want more and yeah. um if if you ever felt like you weren't improving, would would that be good or bad? If, In other words, yeah, not it, not that, but you know what I'm saying. If if you got to a point where you felt like, uh oh, I've reached some sort of peak, I don't know how to get better. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. You never okay. stay the same. Interesting. Ah, there's no plateau. There's no flat surface. You're that's going a, up or that's down. That's actually another sports reference from the 49ers, yes. if you'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick, is your son's name William Wilson? No, actually, it's uh, okay. uh, uh, Jackson, and his middle name is Walsh. Uh, um, okay, great. <clears throat> Jackson is the name of the CEO's son, and Walsh, obviously, after Bill Walsh. Yes, good, good. Now, you mentioned uh, you named him after Bill Walsh, and I, I actually was worried you named him Bill Walsh Wilson, William <laughs> William Walsh Wilson. No, should be a hard thing no. to say. All My the wife time. and I debated back and forth as to uh, <laughs> what his middle name was going to be, and I won a bet. Um, so oh. I got to name him the middle name. Wow, your name was because of a bet. Welcome to life. Do you want to know what the bet was? Yes. I bet him that I bet my wife that uh, the Niner CEO Jed York would not retweet or answer the tweet when I said, hey, my wife said if we retweet this or if you retweet this, I can name my kid after Bill Walsh. And he did. So now he's Jackson <laughs> Walsh. Uh, what a lucky lady. Uh, so is she a hardcore Niners fan like no, you or does she no. just sort of put up with you? She leaves me alone for three hours uh, she- once a week for 16 weeks and sometimes the playoffs. Sometimes, yeah. Is she a big sports fan in general, or does she have her own team, or does she not? <coughs> no, actually, she didn't grow up in a family that followed sports. Um, could care less, honestly. She would, she would rather go to like a painting class or the gym, or you know, play yeah. with the kids than um, than watch okay. watch a game with me. All right. Well, that that you have her as a wife will remain an enigma. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of these days she'll figure me out, but she hasn't done it yet. Okay. Good. <laughs> good. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, real quick, uh, neilwilson.com. dot uh, com. Everybody, go there. It actually is a, a fantastic voiceover website um, because it's very easy to consume. It's clean. Everything works. I see that you update it, so you know that's great. Uh, you're on Twitter and Instagram at Neil Wilson Voice. Uh, and, and then don't forget to go to the podcast page, uh, you know, ryandreen.com, Neil Wilson, and check out various links and pictures there as well. Uh, I think I think we did it, Neil. I think we did it. We've survived. Okay. Uh, Neil Wilson, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Indeed, buddy. Happy, uh, happy holidays and happy new year too, right? Visit ryandreen.com to subscribe, contact the show, and listen to every episode. Please rate and review The Producers Podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. The Producers Podcast with Ryan Dreen.